new fashion style we're going to try here. <laughs> Amen. But I'm grateful you're visiting with us. Thank you for coming and being a part of our service. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 10. 2 Samuel 10. In 2011, attackers forced their way into the homes of some members of the Amish community in northeastern Ohio. They overpowered and restrained these people and then forcibly shaved off the beards of the men and then cut the hair of both men and women, typically to the, to the scalp. Now, to Amish people, to Amish men, the beard is a significant symbol of their faith and their manhood and the way Amish women wear their hair. It's a symbol of their faith. So, shaving the beard, cutting the hair, for these people, it was very... Uh, a shameful and degrading experience. They said that many of the victims that had their beards or hair cut, they became depressed and they refused to appear in public. The attackers were uh, arrested for hate crimes and uh, wound up being convicted and sentenced to prison for this. So think about this. For the men, attacking their beards caused shame and in their minds changed how people viewed them. So the text that we're going to read actually brings out that exact idea. We're going to read about some men that were attacked and had their beards half shaved, just like this, which causes shame. So somebody else did this. But here's my question. What happens when we are the ones who do things that cause our own shame. And we affect how other people view us. So the story that we're going to read is actually a story that brings for you and I, some of you don't have beards, and, uh, but this is actually talking about the power of testimony. I want to preach about beard wars, 2 Samuel 10 Starting verse 1, the Bible says, In the course of time, the king of the Ammonites died, and his son Hanan succeeded him as king. David thought, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent a delegation to express his sympathy to Hanan concerning his father. When David's men came to the land of the Ammonites, the Ammonite commanders said to Hanan, their Lord, do you think David is honoring your father by sending envoys to you to express sympathy? Hasn't David sent them to you only to explore the city and spy it out and overthrow it? So Hanan seized David's envoys, shaved off half of each man's beard, cut off their garments at the buttocks, and sent them away. When David was told about this, he sent messengers to meet the men, for they were greatly humiliated the king said stay at Jericho until your beards have grown and then come back beard wars let's talk about beards of testimony for a moment now in the story David's ambassadors are sent by him to bring a message of condolence to the new king basically they're being polite hey sorry about your dad who passed away but the story revolves around their beards. Verse 4, this man misunderstands. He's suspicious, so he shaved off half of each man's beard. What does that have to do with you if you don't have a beard? The word beard, in you understand the Old Testament written in Hebrew, the root of the word is actually old. And it has the idea of maturity that comes with age, you have to understand this is a cultural thing. For them, a beard was an outward symbol of inner character. In those days, slaves were the ones who shaved. Free men wore beards. And so the reason why the word beard has the idea of old is because for most people, it took time to grow a beard. Some of you, that's not true. By the time service is over, you will have a beard. I know that. <laughs> that is, 
Uh, not true for everyone, but for most people, it takes time. And so when it's talking about a beard, this is not talking about, uh, you know, a, a scruffy, scraggly thing that comes because you're too lazy to shave. For Jews, this was a full lengthy beard that they grew by a deliberate choice. Now, what's interesting, this word beard in the Old Testament, Hebrew, in the New Testament, we get our word elder, presbyter, or even pastor from this. And it is talking about someone that has a proven track record of integrity. 1 Timothy 3 Verse 2 and 3, a bishop, that is the word that in the Old Testament we read, beard. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, good behavior, hospitable, uh, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for, mon uh, for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. So, it is talking about having good character. And final thought about beards is that Ancient people in those days, they would swear by their beards. If they wanted to make a promise, they would say, I swear by my beard that I will. Because what they're saying is, my beard is the symbol of integrity and character. So, this is not a facial hair issue. What this is talking about, a beard then is a symbol and it's a symbol for you and I, man or woman, it's a symbol of your testimony. The word testimony is literally witness, one who speaks with evidence to back up what they say, John 21, 24, the disciple who testifies to these things and wrote them down, we know that his testimony is true. He told us things about Jesus he can back it up. So that is the word testimony. So if you're a Christian, you're supposed to belong to King Jesus. You're supposed to say so, and your life is supposed to back it up with evidence. That's what we call your testimony. And many times, remember, the, the word beard... I'm applying that to testimony. Old, it takes time. Your testimony is built up over time. That is why some people, they get saved and immediately they're able to bring people. But others, they go and announce to their family, now I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to change my life. And the family doesn't immediately do backflips and come to church because they've seen you go through so many phases of life, right? You change. For a while, you were a cowboy then you were a jock, then you were a rapper, then you were a stoner, then you, and now all of a sudden it's Jesus. And they go, yeah, we'll see. Testimony over time. But then when they see real evidence, they see evidence of change and that you stick with it, your words, actions, and attitudes are changed, then it gives uh, uh, some impact. Matthew 7, 16, you'll know them by their fruit. What does their life produce? What's the evidence? So, a testimony. Your testimony that you build up gives you credibility. Credible means you are believable. People now believe your words, and, and in all of life, you are building a testimony. If you're married, you build a testimony with your spouse. You do what you said. You said, I love you, and then your actions backed it up. You said, I'm going to change, and then there was evidence of change or of love. You build a testimony with your spouse. You build a testimony with your children and your family. As they see what you say, it lines up with how you act or how you live. Psalm 78, 57 he commanded their fathers they should make known to their children that the generation to come might know the children who would be born. They might declare to their children so that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments. That's what you're doing. 
If you are a parent, you're teaching them, you know, clean your room, don't pick your nose in public, you know, all kinds of things. But part of what Christian parents do is they are instructing their children about relationship with God. But part of that is how you live. It's not just Bible instruction. It is not just Bible stories. A very important part of instructing children in the fear of the Lord is they watch, they see your actions line up with. That is what we call a testimony. And then, of course, you build a testimony with unbelievers. I want you to understand something. If you tell people you're a Christian, you better believe they're watching you because they want to see. I... uh, Moved to Australia when I was 17 years old. As a, I did an apprenticeship. I went to technical college. I'm now working with uh, Aussie young men, and I'm telling them about Jesus. And I did not realize how much they were watching. I am telling them Jesus changed me, and in many ways, no, I don't act like that because I'm a Christian. And so, you appreciate we had different accents. One day. One of the boys, I was near him and I said something and because of my accent, he thought that I swore. I promise you I didn't that day anyway, but I didn't. (laughs) And he with glee, he threw his hands in the air because I was American, they call me Yankee, they call me Yank. He threw his hands in the air and he said, Yank swore. And every boy in the class, they started cheering, yes! Because they thought They caught me out. See, he's not living what he says. You better, that's what a testimony is. People want to know if you live what you say. There's an old story told about a missionary in India. He was teaching a group of people about Jesus. In the middle of uh, his lesson, a lady walked out of the lesson. She was gone for a few minutes, and then she hurried back in, very attentive, listened to everything else he had to say, and when he uh, uh, presented, gave them an opportunity, if you want to believe on Jesus Christ, she prayed. He asked her, what happened? Why did you leave? She said, I was very interested in what you had to say, but I went out and I asked your driver, does he live like he talks? And when he said yes then I really wanted to hear what you had to say. That is what we call a testimony. And it has powerful influence over time. Many of you understand this. When you first get saved, you tell family and friends, and they're not excited about it for various reasons. I want you to understand, a testimony is built over time. My wife's father, Sam Siciliano, 26 years after his wife got saved, many dec- uh, many years after uh, uh, his children got saved, Sam Siciliano, he knew what we had been saying was right. He saw how we lived over time, and Sam Siciliano gave his heart to Jesus Christ. That is, that is what happens. It takes time in crisis moments This is what happens. At the moment, they may not receive, but if you will live what you say, you are building a testimony. Evidence lines up with your words, and I'm telling you in crisis moments, God is able to touch their heart. See, your testimony is powerful because God adds something supernatural to your words and your actions. Revelations 12, 11, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. What we're doing is not just, you know, common sense. It's supernatural. God takes our words and the example that we lived, and he applies it to people's hearts. I've had people that they tell me years later, I couldn't get those words out of my head that you told me. So God is at work. And then, of course, that scripture tells us there is a protective element to having a good testimony. Revelations 12, 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Talking about the devil. They overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb 
the word of their testimony. It protects your heart when you don't live a lie. If you're living a lie, if you're a different person outside of church than inside of church, you're in danger because you're, the devil gains entrance. People who live what they say are protected. And then, of course, it's practical. You can overcome negative strategies. If you live what's right from time to time, people will falsely accuse you. But your testimony protects you. There are others that say, Abs, that's not true. I know. I watched them over time. So if that is true, that your testimony is so powerful, you have to guard your testimony. Our story is about beards. God told Jewish men in the Old Testament, you are not to trim your beards. Egyptians and others, they had neatly trimmed and, you know, goatees and all kinds of trim, the latest, uh, uh, you know, movie star in Egypt, they would all fashion themselves like that. That's what people do. But, but God told them, you are not to cut it. You are to take care of your beard. In the New Testament then, we're given, there's a repeated statement, and that is we are told to walk worthy. Walk is conduct. Your conduct should be worthy of the Lord or in line with who you represent. You say you have a relationship with Almighty God. He said the walk, your actions better back up who you say you're in relationship. There's a philosopher and teacher named Alexander Papaderos, a Greek man, he was lecturing and he asked, are there any questions? Somebody for a joke said, yeah, what's the meaning of life? And everybody laughed. But Alexander Papaderos, he didn't laugh. From his wallet, he took out a small mirror. It was actually a, a sliver of a mirror. And he told them this story. He said, as a small boy, I found this small fragment of mirror on the road. It became my toy. And he said, I was fascinated that I could shine light, I could reflect light into dark places. That's what I do into holes or, or dark corners of the room. I could cause light to go there. And he said, as I grew older, I learned that reflecting light isn't just a child's game. It's actually a picture of what I can do with my en entire life. I know that I am not the light, but I can reflect the light. The, tr the light of truth is always there, but it will not shine into the darkest places unless I reflect it. And he said, for me, that is the meaning of life. And then he took the mirror and he shined the light in the faces of every person who was listening to that lecture. So that is what we call your testimony. Your beard, the Old Testament, is your testimony. Let's talk secondly about damaged beards. Because in our text, it tells us the truth. Beards, your testimony, can be damaged. Verse 4, that picture is what he did. He shaved off half of each man's beard. So, in this case, it wasn't their fault. Somebody else did it unfairly, but of course... Uh, uh, the problem is people won't listen to you or view you unfavorably because of this. And that was partly a cultural thing. So I'm not talking about what other people do to you. Our problem is we do that to ourselves sometimes. The problem is Christians sometimes damage their own testimony. The Ammonites... Nahash, the man who did, or uh, uh, Hanan, he was an Ammonite. Ammonites were descendants of Lot. They came from his disobedience and his sin. In fact, God had forbidden his people to make alliances with the Ammonites. Why was David making alliances with them? He shouldn't have been doing that. So the fact that the beard was damaged. In fact, that's not 
just Hanan's problem. David did that. So, our problem is that we can do things that damage our own testimony with other people. There are people who say that they are Christians, but they're lousy workers on the job. Right? Other people on the job have to pick up the slack and do their work for them while they're saying, praise the Lord. They are, there are people, unfortunately, that are everywhere they go. They're rude. They're obnoxious. They're contentious. I've had places to go, I go, do you know that guy? It's like, yes. There are people that they claim to be Christians, and yet they have foul mouths just like all of the other workers. They talk crude, sexual talk just like all the other kids. There are people they claim to be Christians, but they're dishonest in their dealings. They say they're Christians, but they don't pay their rent. They don't pay money that they borrowed. And then, of course, all the way to there are people who say they're Christians, but they act just like sinners. They're involved in sin, whatever that. They're sleeping around, smoking weed, whatever the sin is, they're doing it. So here's a great question that sometimes sinners ask people who are supposed to be Christians, and that is, I thought you were supposed to be a Christian. Let me give you a tip. If a sinner is telling you your conduct isn't good enough to be a Christian, that's a problem. I thought you were supposed to be a Christian, but, but, you're, you're, but you're doing this. So that's damaging your testimony. So you know what happens when you damage your testimony? You cause people to doubt God. Now, I don't want to believe in God who is perfect because this guy, he's a lousy worker. He's a, got a foul mouth. He's a pervert. He's dishonest, doesn't pay his bills. So they're doubting God. That's not fair. 2 Samuel twenty two fourteen, 14. You have given the enemies of the Lord great opportunity to despise and blaspheme him. The prophet says, David, your sin caused sinners to mock God. That's not fair. God didn't do it. You did. Many years ago, if you remember, this would be back in the 80s and 90s, I think, late 80s, early 90s, uh, Jimmy Swagger, it came out, a TV preacher, he's famous, but he was caught out twice uh, you know, I think the second time he was caught with a prostitute and pulled over by the police in Indio, California with a prostitute. Around, so I'm living at that time in Melbourne, Australia. That is, that is the other side of the world. Whatever Jimmy Swagger is doing, the other side of the world. I went in, we were recording some music. I went into a recording studio. The guy who ran it, he's a raw sinner and he had a poster on the wall it was the famous picture of Jimmy Swaggart crying tears and the the heading on the poster was Satan to Jimmy Zero think about that so he is mocking the God that Jimmy Swaggart was supposed to represent the way that Jimmy was living this very often works out in people's own children. It's very common that children grow up and then they don't serve God. Sometimes it is because they have watched all their life mom and dad live differently at home. They live differently outside the church than they do in the church. And that causes damn. Why would, why would I? Jesus isn't even real enough to you. You live like a hypocrite. Why would I want to be like that? Damage. The context of our scripture is war. 
They're going into war. Listen, there is a war going on right now for your beard. And I'm talking about your testimony. If the enemy of your soul can cause you to damage your testimony, then he affects other people's lives. He, he, he damages your effectiveness. He can literally cause damage, damage to people's souls. Samson, his disobedience, what was it? His strength left him. Weakness is the result of a damaged testimony. He had no ability to impact unbelievers. And then, of course, there's natural consequences. People who damage their testimony, our scripture says there is embarrassment or shame. Verse 5, they were greatly humiliated. People look at them in, in this way, uh, uh, they look at you unfavorably. People may talk about you. Verse 5, they're greatly humiliated and David was told about this. This is one of the unfortunate side effects of bad decisions. Some people hate this. It's like People are talking about me. Then don't be foolish. That will help. This is a consequence. Then there are natural consequences. David said, wait in Jericho. If you violate the trust of your spouse, your boss, your parents, I'm sorry, just because you go, oops, sorry, that doesn't mean you have the trust back. You can pray to God and be forgiven, but there are consequences this says, and some people resent that from time to time. We have people that they fall into sin or they backslide or whatever, and then they're going to come back or they're going to pray, but they go, if anybody says anything bad about me, I'm out of here. <laughs> that's not going to work. Then I'm sorry, you're going to go. That's, that's a self-inflicted wound. Many people, they don't survive the consequences of their own actions. And in fact, some people, their answer, when they make one bad decision, they add to it, right? I got mad and swore at the boss, so I think I'll go get drunk. That, that's how some people think. They make it worse because they've damaged the beard of their testimony. Let's look at one final thought. I want to talk about regrowing beards of testimony. Because our text gives encouragement to anybody who has damaged their testimony. And the first encouragement we see is that the king does not reject people with damaged beards. He does not reject people with damaged testimonies. When David, the Bible says they told David, can you believe it, these guys, they shaved off half their beards. And when David heard that, that he didn't say, I can't have these people around, people who are like that. I'm going to find some beard perfect people. That's not what he said. Listen, th this is part of it. I'm, I'm teaching on rejection. People with rejection issues this is one of the problems. If they do wrong and they sin, they often don't recover because to them, they think that God is like the person in the past who rejected them when they weren't good enough. That's, that's God in heaven going, look at them. Look, I can't have people in church like that. I need to find some perfect people. But David does not reject people with damaged beards. Jesus, when he rises from the dead, knowing that Peter had denied him three times, deliberately, he says, make sure you go tell Peter that I'm risen from the dead. And he comes and meets with Peter and once again affirms the calling and destiny that he has on his life. In our text, there's great encouragement. It says beards can be regrown. Verse 5, 
stay at Jericho till your beards have grown. Do you know what? If you have damaged your testimony, I want you to understand this. You can reestablish a good testimony. Judges 16, 22, the hair of his head began to grow again after it was shaved. Now, you may have to live with temporary consequences. They had to live in Jericho, stay in Jericho until their beards grew. That took time. I, I can't, I have no magic wand. I can't, bring, and your testimony is magically restored. But it can be restored. You may have to live with the consequences for a time. You, you may have to not react to doubt people who violate somebody else. Then often, then they're mad like, I said sorry like an hour ago. How come you don't trust me? Well, it's going to take some time. And I know that can be taken too far, but, but this is the fact. If you won't react to snide remarks, lack of trust, if you just say, I know, I did it, I'm going to do right from now, then God will help them. You rebuild a testimony with right decisions over time. That's what rebuilds it. So you, you made bad decisions. You caused people to doubt your word. Okay. If you will simply make right decisions over time, you can rebuild a damaged testimony. And the reason why I know is because it's not just you. God will get involved and help you. Listen, God supplies supernatural help for people who want to regrow their testimony. If we had kept reading this story, they go to war, and in this battle, God's people, God helped them to win. Listen, God helped them with the very people they damaged their testimony with. And that is true. Some of you here... You've damaged your testimony. That does not mean that your children, your family, your workmates, your classmates are doomed to hell forever. If you will from now begin to rebuild, cry out to God, God will help you supernaturally. You can change your testimony. I close. There's a very old story that illustrates that principle. It's said that in the Old West, two brothers were caught stealing sheep. And when they were caught as punishment for their crimes, they were branded with a hot iron on their foreheads, the letters S-T, sheep thief, so that everywhere they went, people would know what they had done, they would have to wear their shame. One brother couldn't handle that. He couldn't handle people looking at him like that. He began to drink heavily, wound up committing suicide. But the other brother was determined to rebuild his life. So he quietly worked a job in his spare time. He would often help other people. He would help put out fires, mend fences, He'd be there to help when people had a need. Many years went by. Years later in the town, a small boy saw this man for the first time. S.T. was still branded on his forehead. And he said, Daddy, what does S.T. stand for on that man? And he said his father thought for a moment. He said, I don't remember, but I think it stands for saint. Because that is what God can do. There are people, they have horribly blown their testimony. But if they'll accept the consequences, they'll determine to change, make right decisions, and cry out to God. I want to tell you, God will help you rebuild a damaged testimony. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes all across this place, if you would. Thank God, I appreciate every one of you that are here. 
You've listened to God's word. Some of you, I want to speak to you, first of all, that you are not right with God. I'm, I've talked about people who are supposed to know God and don't live it, but some of you, you've never begun the relationship with Almighty God. You've never dealt with your sin problem. Because the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin has consequences. Guilt and shame, addictions and relationship problems. And then if you continue to live in sin, you can be judged in hell forever. But listen, that is not what God wants. I'm preaching good news. And the good news is Jesus Christ is the answer for your sin problem. Jesus Christ came to earth. This is God's gift to us. God in human form lived as a man the perfect life we could never live, died on the cross to pay for our sin. Listen, I said in this story, the king did not reject people who had problems. And that is God. He does not hate you for your sin. Rather, he loves you. He would love to forgive you for everything you've ever done wrong. He would love to take away guilt and shame, to break addictions. He wants to change you. He wants you to have relationship with him. How many people are here as God would deal with you this morning? You would say, Pastor Greg, I am not right with God, and I know that. But I want to get right with God. I want to turn from my sin. If that's you this morning, if you want to pray with an honest heart, that's how you turn from your sin. You pray. Ask God to forgive you. Tell him you believe in Jesus Christ. If you want to do that, I want to help you. Our heads are bowed. This is private. But if you want to pray to turn from your sin, I want you to lift up your hand so I can see it. How many would there be? Pastor Greg, I need Jesus. I want to turn from my sin. I want to get right with God. All across this place, lift up your hand so I can see it. I know that I'm not right with God. God would not be pleased with the way I'm living. But I want to turn from my sin. How many here? Lift up your hand. Hold it up. Amen. There's a hand there. God bless you. Thank you. I appreciate your honesty. Some of you are backslidden. The thought of damaged testimony. Some of you, this is what you did. You were saved, but then you went back completely to the old life. You're living in sin, but God's given you hope. He has not given up on you if you're backslidden. He wants to heal you. He wants to restore you. How many backsliders lift up your hand? I need to get right with God. All across this place, others, you want to respond. Someone's being honest, but I want others. You need to be honest as well. Lift up your hand. I want to turn from my sin and live for God. Amen. There's a hand. You lifted your hand. Look up at me. This one. Did you mean that? Yes? Come here. I want to have some pray with you. God bless you. I appreciate your honesty. Matt's going to help you to pray. Thank God. God bless you, man. Just kneel down at the front right there. Matt will help you to pray. God bless you. Thank God. There may be others that you didn't lift your hand, but God's dealing with you. You can make things right with God. He will help you begin to heal today. You can begin that process. Let's all stand up to our feet. I'm going to open the altars. There are people here, God's dealt with you about your testimony, the way you are living, lining up with the way you talk that I'm opening the altars. You come, tell God, I want to have a good testimony. Help me do that. And they're going to sing while people are coming. I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Oh, bless me now, my sin.
every hour I need thee. Oh, bless, bless me, me now, my Savior. I come, come to thee. And I need thee. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Sing it again. I need thee. I need thee. One more time, I need thee. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Let's thank God. God for his faithfulness right now. God, we thank you. Oh, God, we praise you for your faithful love. Oh, God, it's a privilege to serve you. Thank God. Let's bow our heads. God, there are people that are here. God, they're wrestling with the issue of testimony. Some of them have damaged their testimony. Give them hope. I pray that you'll put confidence that you can help them to rebuild their testimony. God, I'm asking, some of them need a miracle. God, with their children. I am asking, God, with their family, their friends, schoolmates and workmates, God, they need a miracle. Help them. Give them the strength to rebuild and make right decisions over time. And then, God, I'm asking you to do what we cannot do. Get involved. Overcome our bad decisions and bring something good from our lives. God, I thank you for it. I know you're going to do that in Jesus' name. Let's praise God again. Oh, God, I am so grateful. God, you're going to help us. I believe that you're going to help us in Jesus' name. Thank God. Thank God. We're going to be dismissed. I want to invite you. We have an e